I think the younger generation of Christians uh, perhaps wouldn't fully appreciate Leon's contribution. So I think there's a, there is a really strategic impact that he had that wasn't perhaps fully appreciated. I sensed that and when I did the research, it proved to be true. He was very influential, far more than probably most Australians would imagine. And it's very hard to understand the Australian church without understanding something of the impact of Leon Morris. There's quite a number of things going on in the first half of the 20th century. There are the wars and the way that German scholarship is seen. There's the Great Depression at home, the social instability that comes with that, the rise of the social gospel movement or the removal of the supernatural from Christian faith. Leon, after the Second World War, is in a sense dealing with those leftover debates from the first half of the 20th century. But Australia at the time and until the 50s and 60s was still, you know, a churchy kind of place. So it wasn't anti-Christian, but I think Leon brought a theological depth and, and intellectual clarity to the statement of Christianity, which people found really compelling. That was, that was very exciting. preached by Dr. Leon Morris on Sunday the 24th of March 1979 in the morning. In today's epistle, Ephesians 2, 8, we read, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. I think he's most well known for his skill as a commentator. When people write Bible commentaries, they respond to other commentaries. But Leon didn't read the other commentaries, he just studied the text and wrote his commentary and then after he'd written his commentary, would study the other commentaries to find out what they said, which meant that his main focus was actually on the text, not on what other people said about the text. And it's partly why I think his books sold so well, not really in the academic arena, but they sold very well in the, what I would call the pastoral arena, clergy. But his great contribution was from the 1940s onwards to interact with the writings of C.H. Dodd, who was an English New Testament scholar, and his life's work really, that is Leon's life work really, was around the doctrine of the atonement. So the argument was, did God, could God express wrath? Could a God of love express wrath towards his creatures? And it was assumed by C.H. Dodd and others that no, that God was incapable of that kind of emotion. And Leon argued that indeed, there is a case to be made for that and builds particularly around Romans 3 to make his case. Leon regarded C.H. Dodd very, very highly and he quotes him in some of his uh, commentaries, yeah, you can see, but he disagreed with Dodd's view about God and about the wrath of God. And Leon just demonstrated that Dodd was actually sidelining some of the evidence about God and God's wrath. Uh, it was pretty clear that by the time he got to doing his Masters in Theology that he probably would move into academia. And then he came here to Ridley in 1945. He was invited by the then Principal Bishop Baker as the junior lecturer. He did his PhD in England at Cambridge in 5051 and he came back here in 52. He then lectured here until 59 and then he left um, to study and to tour the United States and then he was um, asked to consider going to Tyndale House in Cambridge as the warden. He was very very happy at Cambridge and could see that he could stay there. He said in various bits of correspondence I would love a job in the divinity department at Cambridge. And he was so popular in America that Billy Graham offered him a job. But he also spoke in Asia and South America and so on. So he was a world figure, really. But then the Ridley boys wrote to him and said, we need you, will you come back? His first um, comment to one of our old clergymen who was a member of the Ridley board was, I wish the board would go and jump in the Yarra and send the invitation to somebody else. 
<laughs> it's, it's just a reflection of how happy he was in England. We think Melbourne's a big city now, and it is. But in those days, it was kind of a backwater theologically, really. I mean, uh, he, he take, you come back to Melbourne, you take yourself out of the limelight, you take yourself out of the English-American kind of network, and you sit here at Ridley College. But Leon had a very firm sense of duty, and I, I'm sure that he thought God was calling him to Ridley, and so he came. And it was a remarkable principle, because he not only continued his regime of writing, but uh, lectured very competently. His door was always open to students, which was wonderful. He raised lots of money to uh, do up the buildings and you know, put the college on a good financial position. And he was also traveling around the world speaking. So it, it was an extraordinary combination of activities, really. Um, he mentored people here. So, you know, uh, Dr. David Williams, um, was mentored by Leon in some ways. Uh, Peter Adam would tell you that Leon mentored him. But Leon didn't sit down with them week after week and say, you know, this is what I do, this is how you should think it through. It was more casual than that. Occasionally they'd talk to Leon, he'd tell them what he thought, and they listened to him and it absorbed it from that level. Adam's a good example. He probably is perhaps the better, best example we've got at Ridley, because he ended up the principal here. Peter was a very particular personality. Uh, he obviously loved Leon, and he also loved making fun of Leon, and Leon knew he was making fun of him. <laughs> in those days, when I was a student, chapel was at seven in the morning. Everybody had their place in chapel, and Leon had a map where everybody sat. So if you missed chapel, you had to apologise in person. So I used to save up my apologies till Friday and say, <laughs> knock on the door. Dr. Morris, I've come to apologise for missing chapel on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday morning. <laughs> Wicked boy that I was. And Leo would gave the same reply every Friday. Have you an effective waking device? Well, I would call it an alarm clock, but for Leon it was an effective waking device. I'd say, yes, Dr. Morris, use it. Thank you, Dr. Morris. That was it. <laughs> I think I've only met him in person twice. I feel like I know him. He, he rang me up and in 2001, and I'll never forget because he rang up and he said, hello, you might have heard of me. My name is Leon Morris. Very humble man. I said, yes, I certainly have heard of you. I mean, by the stage I met, when I met him the second time, um, he, dementia was setting in. And he said he was wanting now to give us his library. Um, he and his wife were going into aged care, into a unit. And so we went over and we packed up, on a Saturday we packed the entire library, but we also packed up all his papers. There's copies of manuscripts for his books. He, I think he kept copies of every letter he ever sent or received. He was a very good correspondent. He would reply to letters from whoever wrote to him. And from a research and an archivist's point of view, it's great because it's all there. Neil Bark's book is mainly about his life. And I think he said that um, he hopes there'll be research. He spent his whole life defending the view and arguing the view that the cross of Christ was central to the Christian faith. And I think you see a lot of theology now debating all sorts of things, and it's easy for the centrality of what happened on the cross to be kind of pushed to the side a bit. I think Leon would say, uh, never lose that. Um, I don't think Leon would think that remembering him is particularly important. But I think if, if it's a way of remembering the values he stood for, then it is worth doing. But it's more important from my point of view that, with, that Ridley continues uh, to be committed to the Bible and the careful exposition of the Bible and the cross. Leon gave 
a fine example of servant-hearted ministry. He wasn't building his reputation or an empire. He, was, he had wonderful gifts from God. He was using them for other people. <laughs> that's, that's a wonderful thing to do. And that's a great model. Wasn't trying to be a celebrity, just a servant.